Hi, and thank you so much for visiting my YouTube channel. I'm Natalie Brunel, and normally I interview people within the Bitcoin and crypto space, but I have a very special guest today, David Hunter. David is the chief macro strategist for Contrarian Macro Advisors, and he's a financial expert with more than 40 years of Wall Street experience. David is well known for predicting that we're going to have a final melt up stage in the market cycle before a historic crash that rivals 1929. But can't we keep just kicking the can down the road and muddling through? Well, I talked to David about his predictions, his backstory, even about his thoughts on Bitcoin. Here's David. All right. Well, David, thank you so much for, for joining me. I know a lot of people are just so curious about your forecast. So just thank you for your time, first of all. Yeah, thanks, Natalie. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, I just want to start out with your origin story. Um, did you grow up in the Midwest? I saw you went to Valparaiso. So I just kind of was curious about your upbringing. Sure. Yeah, I actually grew up in Connecticut. So I'm, I'm a New Englander from uh, the very early days. But um, at the, as a senior in high school, decided I wanted to try a different part of the country. And Valparaiso, Valparaiso kind of fit my... Um, I guess my interest in at a business school and it was right side school for me. So I went out there sight unseen. Um, it was a bit of a culture shock first year, but uh, grew to love it. Um, graduated from Valpo and stayed in the college town there working in a bank as an in, the, in their investment department uh, right out of school. Uh, spent four more years there, got my MBA from DePaul, so commuted while working, uh, I'd head up to Dan Ryan. Um, you know, I'd, I'd jump out of, out of work at four o'clock, uh, grab a Big Mac and head up to Dan Ryan for a six o'clock class. So I uh, did that for two and a half years, got my MBA and uh, decided to come back East. I, uh, it was some soul searching. Do I want to stay here? Do I want to go to Texas? Do I want to go out East? And I, I went back East, um, worked in another bank, it was a bigger bank, so I had to choose between a uh, bank portfolio, which is mostly bonds, and, and trust portfolio, which is stock. So I chose trust. I loved the stock market and uh, went from there to Textron, ran their um, equity pension funds, had top one percentile numbers for five years, um, and took a, took a company that was very anti-equities from 10% equity to 50% equity kicking and screaming because I was, you know, performance was there and they, they kept saying, uh, actually their chairman prior to my arriving was a guy named G. William Miller, who was Fed chairman under Jimmy Carter uh, oh. after he left Textron. So he was gone by the time I got there, but his, he, had, he was a legend there. And they kept saying, you know, Bill told us never to do this. What are we doing? And I was a 30 year old kid telling them you could invest in, in equities conservatively. And we had great numbers, so the portfolio grew. They kept adding money to it. Um, went from there to Fidelity and then uh, headed up um, ITT Hartford Active Equity Department um, and, and then was a CIO in New York at one point. So uh, that was my first half of my career and second half has been as a, a macro strategist. Wow. It's funny you mentioned the Dan Ryan. I'm from Chicago, so very familiar. <laughs> um, just, just out of curiosity, when you were a kid. I mean, do you remember growing up always wanting to work in finance? I mean, what was it that sparked that interest for you? Yeah, it's funny. My, uh, you know, I was um, really, I declared as a finance major before I got there. And this was 1969. And I would say most of my peers at that time, most kids going into college were doing it to get a deferment from the draft because it was Vietnam War time. And, uh, so I'd say the majority of people going to school at that time were what we called hearts and flowers, but liberal arts. And uh, so a finance major at that, you know, during those times was pretty rare. Um, but I, for whatever reason, I, I had that interest. I liked math, et cetera, and spent four years as a finance major, never, uh, never changed and had a finance um, emphasis in my MBA. So I knew Pretty early on, I wanted to um, go into the investment field. And um, so it was, I felt fortunate coming out of school because coming out of a little school like Valpo, it wasn't easy to get right to Wall Street. 
so I felt fortunate. I was able to get into a department, uh, an investment department, and it was, uh, you know, my my boss at that time was a pretty dynamic young guy that had come out of Indianapolis, and so I learned a lot. Um, and because it was a two-man department, I was given lots of responsibilities early on. So it it really, I I give a lot of credit to that four years for my macro background. It, it you know, got me a good foundation to start with. And in the 70s, when you were in college, I mean, that's the last time we really saw those high inflation levels. Um, and this was before the secular bull market started. So does that kind of impact, I mean, thinking back on that time, does that impact how you view the way where we are now? I'm sure. Not so much the college years, because um, actually, it, when I started in 73, right out of school, um, the Nifty 50 was um, the story, and it was an all-time high in the stock market at that time. It was basically dominated by 50 stocks that were all you know, big blue chip growth stocks. Most of the money was man, most of the pension money was managed by the New York City banks. So they all went to the same luncheons and bought the same stocks. And it, the market got very narrow as it got to the top. And that nifty 50 kind of has been a, a you know, learning early on that there was both upside and risk to stock investing was a great lesson. So I became a value manager right from the outset and learn, you know, the importance of risk management. So that that was probably my biggest lesson coming out of school. And then, you know, as you went through the 70s and got to the late 70s is when inflation really took off. Um, and that was because of actually G. William Miller, as Fed chairman, made a big, big mistake um, pouring money into an already inflating economy. Um, and sort of, sort of kind of what we're seeing right now. <laughs> yeah. um, but again, I, I do say that having the experience of investing during that period is a huge advantage today because most of the people investing today and most of the people you know, calling markets today didn't live through inflation because we've had this inflation for 40 years and it's a whole different ballgame. Yeah, I bet. Um, just out of curiosity, how do you define contrarian? Yeah, that's a good question because uh, different people use contrary uh, investing in different ways. I knew somebody that basically said, if you know, if everybody's on on this side, I'm on the other side. I don't care. You know, I don't really care what the stock looks like or what have you. It's just you know, it's totally. I want to be against the crowd. Mine is, uh, as I say, at turning points, particularly looking at markets, at turning points, um, meaning top or bottom, the vast majority of investors will be um, at a bottom bearish and at a top very bullish. And so a contrarian wants to go opposite to that because you know your best opportunities is when everybody has, has acted on their bearishness and has sold and same thing as we're approaching now, when everybody's all in, you know, the market's at full value and it can only go down from there. So I find on the two extremes, I'm most comfortable being all by myself. I, uh, my best calls are when nobody agrees with me and everybody thinks I'm an idiot. It's, it's during that middle part where the consensus can be right. And you've probably seen on Twitter, um, you know, we are approaching a top but we're not there yet. And, you know, yes, in March of 2020, I was pretty alone in being bullish. Right now, I'm not alone in being bullish. And yet, and people go, I thought you were a contrarian. You're not a contrarian. You're agreeing with everybody. And I go, yeah, well, there's times when I'll be contrary and times when I won't. So I'm not a knee-jerk contrarian, I guess I would say. Is there a certain point where you pivoted to that, where before you were not on the, the contrary side of how you view the financial markets? Yeah, I would say, you know, early on coming right out of school, you know, you're kind of learning, learning things. So I, I, I won't claim that I had this down then, but I pretty early in my career, I recognized that, you know, um, it was better to be, uh, like I said, I, I became a value manager pretty early on. And that's more or less picking stocks that are out of favor or at least down, you know, down relative to their history. So I, I was a contrarian pretty early in my career. I don't know exactly when. Um, and then I also say, I think it helps 
Um, and I've studied behavioral um, economics and behavior in markets for a long time, having having you know that as a primary part of my my process. Uh, and I got to say, the vast majority of people have to be with the crowd. They they aren't comfortable being away from the crowd. So even if they want to be contrary, um, you know, I see a lot of people claiming to be contrary, but I can tell you, when you <clears throat> excuse me, when you go to that that true extreme most people just don't have you know it's it's not within them to say i'm comfortable being away from the crowd so it's a it's a human nature thing too i mean i'm just very comfortable if people are here and i'm here that's great yeah no that's interesting well it's funny you mentioned sentiment and just behavior because right now you always talk on twitter about everyone's really skittish everything's very frothy and people have one foot in one foot out but to you that's been very bullish right yeah and it's it's hard because we are you know the market the nasdaq's more than doubled in the last 15 months um so we are up a lot and certainly there's a lot more bulls today than there were a year ago um but it's all relative and so what i say is yes put call ratios certainly show there's plenty of bullishness out there yes some of the popular sentiment indicators still show a lot of bulls but if you step back and look at it, you know, in other ways, it's kind of a relative thing to say um, people are nervously bullish. You know, they're in there, but they're also talking about a top right around the corner or, you know, saying, you know, this thing could crash any time. So, so it's, you have to kind of look between the lines sometimes and not just look at black and white um, sentiment. I wanted to just ask you, I mean, people who follow you know your forecast. Um, it's, you know, for some people, it's a little controversial, this massive melt up and then a 65 to 80% crash, the worst financial crisis that we've seen since uh, 1929. So I just wanted you to kind of summarize maybe the short term and the long term thesis that you have. Sure. Um, yeah, for sure. It's controversial because it's, it's pretty unprecedented. Whereas I keep saying we're in uncharted territory. Um, and part of that is because we saw a fiscal and monetary stimulus like we've never seen before. Um, you know, nothing's been close to this before. And that's a big part of, of the markets. It's also the pandemic and going from being totally shut down to being, op you know, opening up again. Um, there's a big, you go from rock bottom to, you know, big demand. Um, and, and so it's a question of how far um, that can take you. I've also, what has helped me in this, certainly the last year and a half, uh, and probably started before that, I was calling for a, a parabolic end to the cycle anyway, before the pandemic, um, is knowing that, you know, my view has been that we are in the 39th year of a 39 year secular bull market. That's not household view out there. Um, I date it back to 1982 when disinflation really started, when interest rates peaked and, it, and inflation peaked. And we've been ratcheting down inflation ever since. So that um, has an inverse relationship with price earnings multiples. So as rates came down, uh, price earnings multiples expanded. We were single digits back in 1982. We're now up in the mid 20s. So um, with, with this being the end of a secular bull market, I always believed that we would see, as we have seen in some of the past secular bull markets, a final, the markets would, the slope would increase on the, on the uh, bull market as we went along, and then the final leg would be almost vertical. So that's really what I mean by a parabolic, uh, you know, up leg here that will end it. And it's followed that script pretty well, really, in the last year. So that's um, that's my expectation, anyway. Is that we are we're getting closer time wise, but you can cover an awful lot of ground in that last um, couple months, two or three months of the bull market as this thing goes vertical. I mean, going back to what you said about sentiment, how do we get a situation where we go so vertical when literally every time we move up a little bit, people start to sell again and it's just teetering back and forth, you know, it's lifting off and then it's coming back down. It's It just seems like it's so bipolar. Yeah, well, what happens is, and you saw it with the growth stocks, with the 
FANG stocks, for example. Um, you've seen it of late. Uh, you saw it with Russell. Um, the, the market goes through what I call legs to the bull market, um, which is, you know, rallies that pretty much, they, they all stair step, but they are in a general uptrend. And then all of a sudden they go flat. They might go flat for and get into a trading range. They might do that for a couple months. They might do it for six or eight months. So um, the Russell's been in a sideways, high level, high, high end consolidation for four months. Um, the fangs really since the beginning late last year, I guess. So that's been almost six months. Um, you know, you've seen lots of people jump on me about the, the slow upside to gold and silver, even though I've been very bullish, that's been in a sideways consolidation, you know, a broad sideways consolidation, but, um, since early August. So consolidation is the period between two legs. So you have an up leg, then you have to consolidate that up leg, and then you have the next up leg. And I would argue that we're just emerging from, from that consolidation in many of these um, asset categories and many of these markets. So it looks to me like the balance of this month and into the balance of the summer is that next up leg. And whether that up leg lasts Two months or three months i don't really know you know it, it, but it's going to get vertical pretty fast i think can you talk a little bit about how you determine these forecasts um because it almost seems to me like if you're a contrarian then you just you would just pick what's opposite from what everyone else views right but i'm sure there's so much there's a big recipe to this so what do you look at and how did you determine that you believe that this financial crisis is just ahead of us yeah so it's you know it's a lot of different pieces as i say kind of broadly um when people ask i go I, I use fundamentals, technical analysis, um, cross market analysis, which means I use different markets. I'll look at you know bonds to help me decide what I think about stocks, or I'll look at sectors of the stock market to help me see what's going on in terms of where what stage we're in in the stock market. I'll use the dollar. I'll use you know various markets, and when they when they kind of tell the same story or they all fit into a story it helps my convictions in terms of how strong I am with my forecast. Um, in terms of my confidence in, in a, a bust and what I define as a bust is something between a recession and a, and a depression. It's got some of the, the extreme damage of a depression, but happens in, at the speed of a recession. Um, and it, the thing that's really driving that forecast right now is just we are off, we are off the rails in terms of leverage. You know, and I, as I say, let, everybody talks about debt in terms of leverage, but derivatives are also leverage. They're leverage on the market. And we are at levels never seen in history by a wide margin. You know, even 2008-9 was pales by comparison to where we are today in leverage. And as you learn in business school, leverage works both ways. On the way up, it enhances everything. It, it exacerbates the upside. On the way down, it greatly exacerbates the downside. It makes things so much worse. And in leverage, um, a lot of people who are going to be, a lot of companies, a lot of people who are over leveraged when the economy turns down, can't service their debt. And that's where bankruptcies come. So um, that's why I call it a bust. We're going to see, I think, a lot of um, involuntary debt liquidation in this cycle. Well, I mean, based on what you're saying, it seems like you believe that this is truly unavoidable or inescapable. Is that the case? And you know, why can't we muddle through? It seems like looking back at history, even in the last few decades, we've always seemed to just muddle through. Why is it inescapable this time? Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. It, it's um, nothing's. Uh, cast in concrete, you know, there's, it's a probability business. So I can only say, I think the probabilities are high that we're going to see this. I could be wrong. Um, I've been wrong before. I've had a great run this last year and a half. Um, and so people on Twitter um, kind of act like, you know, you're never going to make the mistake or I'm doing everything you tell them. You know, I, I don't make offer advice or make recommendations, but people follow the forecast. And you know, I have 
question people. I can be wrong for sure. Um, and, you know, there are people on Twitter that, you know, my oil call hasn't been exactly right in the last month or month and a half. So they love to point that out, you know, because a lot of things have been right. Um, so the bust doesn't have to happen the way I expect it. And certainly time wise, it can get stretched out. But I really feel the combination of um, an overheating economy coming out of pandemic and as we're seeing inflation that's um, rising and, and rising beyond anything we've seen in the last few decades um, is going to force the Fed to have to, it's going to force the Fed's hand. This is where the experience of living through the late 70s comes in, is this is exactly what happened in the late 70s, is Bill Miller um, thought he could just control interest rates and that everything would be a fine. Well, the control interest rates, he had to keep printing money to keep the rates from going higher. The problem is more money creates more inflation and more inflation creates higher interest rates. So it was, you know, he was wrong. And that's what Jay Powell's problem is going to be is that if, um, if inflation breaks out here more, uh, if he chooses to ignore it, it's pay me now or pay me later. The more he ignores it, the more the tightening is going to take place later. So he's choosing right now to say, we have room. It's transitory. We don't have to tighten yet. The longer he waits, I think the more inflation is going to heat up. And, and the, we're, in a, we're in a perfect storm in that the pandemic has created a lot of fragility in the system. You know, we're just a very different economy than we were two years ago because of the pandemic and shutting down the economy and all the things it's done. So it has very little tolerance for tightening. And he's going to be forced to tighten, I believe, anyway. Uh, and tightening doesn't mean, OK, I turn the switch and I raise rates a quarter or I pull money out of the system and, and I fixed it and we can go merrily along. Tightening, history tells you that when inflation breaks out, it takes more than just a little tightening to get it to back under control. And the Fed almost always goes too far because there's leads and lags to that. So as they go to tighten, the inflation is going to continue going up. So they tighten some more. The inflation goes up more. They tighten some more. And all of a sudden you look and you go, oh, my God, we're straight down. So. Everybody thinks he can turn a switch and fix inflation, and then he can turn a switch if he sees that it's gone too far and, and avoid a bust. Leads and lags means it, it's not going to happen that way. You know, you're, am, I, am I right that we're going to go down 80% in the stock market? I don't know, but I think that's the risk. Am I right that it's going to be the biggest economic decline that we've seen in the post-World War II era? I might be wrong, but I, that's what it looks like to me. So my forecasts are what I see in my work, and all I can do is just be honest with what I see. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident that I'm, uh, you know, I'm on the right side of this thing. Uh, you know, as to the actual numbers, how they, what they shake out, the market could fall 50% instead of 80. Um, you know, we could have an economy that's bad, but not that bad. And by the way, this is global. I, I focus on the U.S., but the problems here are the problems everywhere. The leverage is across the globe. The fragility is across the globe. And the central banks are all going to be in the same boat at, at some point in the next year. Is there anything that you believe the Fed could do to avoid this kind of doomsday scenario with this massive bust? They're trying. I mean, they're doing the things. I, I was very critical of um, Jay Powell up until March of 2020. Um, I was very critical of him in 2018 when he over tightened or when he raised rates and it created the Christmas Eve sell off um, and the sell off into the Christmas Eve. Um, and I was pretty critical of him through 2019 saying, He's still behind the curve. He doesn't understand that he's weakening the economy and that, you know, this economy is going to be in trouble. When 2020 hit, when March 2020 hit, he got up to speed very quickly. And I've been pretty much um, supportive of his what he's been doing ever since in terms of saying, you know, he moved quickly. 
Um, if he hadn't moved quickly, this thing could have, we could have seen the bus sooner. Um, so he's postponed the bus, bus by his quick actions. Um, it took a lot of courage to do what he did because there was no uh, playbook for what he did. You know, Bernanke had to do some things that were new to him. And, you know, what happened in March 2020 was really uncharted. So um, Paul had to get up to speed pretty quick. I've, I've said he's been, you know, he's not an economist. He had on the job training all through the last few years. But I give him a lot of credit for being a pretty quick learner and doing the right things. It's not perfect. Um, and frankly, a lot of the criticism, particularly from those in, uh, from the Austrian school that hate the Fed and think the Fed's the reason we're here. Um, the problem is we're, you know, we're in a, um, a Western democracy. There is no way our policymakers are going to say, we're going to take tough medicine and throw 35% of the workforce out of work and let homeless spike and let everything, you know, and do it on purpose because we know that will wind out in inflation and we'll have to take the pain now to avoid it. It's just not realistic to think our policymakers can do that. So they've got to respond when they see crisis. And he's, he's responded. The problem is, um, which isn't his fault, but the problem is more of that medicine leads to more extreme cycles, which leads to when we fall, we're going to fall even bigger. So what do you do? I mean, he's kind of between a rock and a hard place, you know. And then on top of that, the criticism I would throw in is our policymakers, both government officials and uh, Fed governors, have a history of not understanding leads and lags and not understanding that their policies that they put in place, um, they go too far and they end up creating much bigger booms and busts. Um, so if they'd step out of the way, it would be better. If, if we could turn the clock back 50 years and say, OK, um, we're not going to have the Fed trying to manage cycles and we're, you know, we're going to just let the economy free market take care of things, we'd be much better off. But in today's world where we've done the damage we've done in the last 50 years, it's not realistic to say we're going to take the Fed out of the picture and we're just going let, to you know, let the marbles roll where they will. So is there anything that could be done to avoid this massive deflationary bust? Like if you were the Fed chairman, what would you do right now? Uh, good question. I, I, I would say um, certainly I think there's there's two problems. One is, you know, our government policies are terrible. You know, we, we need to be more free market where, you know, the, it is exactly that the policymakers are um, going to lead to, you know, create more problems. Um, so I'd go more free market with with things. You need regulation, but you don't need all the regulation we have. You know, look what we did. We basically, and again, it's hard to turn the clock back, but we basically in the last 30, 40 years, 50 years, uh, but particularly in the last 20 or 25, uh, shipped all our jobs overseas, shipped our manufacturing overseas. Um, you know, China's, um, you know, got the bulk of that now. And we really got it our economy. So now we're a service economy that doesn't, you know, make nearly the things we used to make. I think some of that's going to reverse in the next 10 years. And I would try to speed that up. Um, but again, this is global. So it's, you know, how, how do you fix a global problem when you have all these independent banks and independent policymakers looking after their own situation on the Fed side? Um, you know, I, I'd, I'd be probably quicker to recognize the leads and lags and they're going to go too far, whether they know it or not. I'd probably be um, tightening now, um, but they're not going to do that. I mean, you know, it's pretty clear. They think they've got a couple of years. I think they'll be tightening by the fall, but, but um, you know, in their mind, you know, you see that you see the forecasting models out there, wall street models out there. And most people are predicting tight, you know, interest rates hike for the first time in 2023 and maybe they move it to late 2022 well the reality is i don't know if they're going to hike rates but they're certainly going to do qt meaning pull money out of the system uh this year so you know the fed's not there yet but you know if i were there i would probably be there now 
So how does this play out? How does the scenario of the deflationary bust start to play out? How do we know that we're seeing it and we're in it? Yeah, the first thing will be the stock market. Markets lead the economy. So you're probably going to see you know, the first 20 or 30 percent down in the market, maybe more before you see the the economy turning over. So that'll be the part, part of it. I mean, if you want to really anticipate that, it's the inflation. As, you know, I think we're probably in for a couple of months here where like lumbers come down. I, I still think oil prices probably come off of here. I don't know if they go back to the 50s, but I think they definitely come off of here. Um, and I think inflation in general for the next month or two um, on a rate of change basis is going to be coming in a little bit. That's going to help bonds. Um, so it's when, when that ratchets back up and you know, later in the summer or early fall, that's the first sign that inflation is going to be you know, front and center again. And the Fed's going to have to react to it at some point. Um, those will be signs. But the market will be your first leading indicator that, that, that the bust is coming. Um, you know, and I may be too, too early on the bust, but I'm, I'm still saying I think we see a top in the stock market this summer and the bus begins before the end of the year. I think 2022 is a washout. You know, I think 2022 is a bad economy the whole year. The stock market may turn before mid-year next year um, because it leads. But, you know, in other words, it may bottom out by then. But the, the economy itself is probably going to be in a rough uh, place all year long next year. Other than the stock market, are there any other vulnerable sectors where we might look for this happening? Um. Sure, you can you can look at spreads. You, you know, you're going to see. I think probably as as inflation heats back up, you're probably going to see the bond markets start to back up. So you're going to see. You know, you're going to want to focus on interest rates and bonds. Um, you're probably going to see. I I've been calling for a 120, 1.2 percent ten year, probably at 1.9 or 1.95 30 year. As the Fed as inflation picks up and the Fed has to you know, come into a tighten. You're going to see those rates move. So the 10-year will move up to two and a half, I think, later this year, and the 30-year up to 3%. As you see that happening, you're going to see that's probably going to start impacting the stock market. And it's certainly, you know, the leading edge of what's going to impact the economy. Um, so you can watch that, uh, watch the bond market and interest rates. Um, you know, dollar, I think, is going to get weaker here. I'm not sure you can time anything off of that, but I think you know, dollar's going to get a lot weaker in the next few months. Um, and commodities, as you see commodities heat up, that's going to be a sign that the Fed's got their hands full, you know, looking forward. It's interesting about the U.S. dollar because it seems like you are predicting sort of a, a weakening and then an incredible strengthening where you're very bullish on the dollar for a while, but then ultimately so much printing has to happen that it severely weakens the dollar, right? So can you talk a little bit about sort of that long-term thesis and what this country looks like after a deflationary bust um, and then sort of this this change in the economy while you know things like digital currencies start to come out? What's going to happen? Yeah, my, as I say, my, my forecast can get a little schizo here because it's big downs and big ups and big downs. And it's like, what are you doing? Um, and I tell people, it's not my personality type. It's where we are in the cycle, in the super cycle. So, um, but the dollar um, can uh, go down to 85, maybe even 80 here on the dollar index, currently, you know, around 90. Um, and that's what I expect probably over the summer. Um, whenever the bust hits, you're going to see, I think the dollar get that flight to safety um, premium. Um, as much as we have problems in this country, we are still viewed by the world as the safest, um, most um, organized capital market and economy. So you will see people from around the world run to the dollar when there's so much uncertainty in the global economy. So that will cause the dollar, let's say it gets to 80. I'm not sure if it gets that low, but if it does, uh, I think the dollar can go from there to 120 and maybe higher than 120 in the following year. And that will be mostly people saying, yeah, the U.S. isn't great, but boy, it's better than, you know, it's, it's the best dirty shirt in the laundry, you know, it's, and so, you will see the dollar get a premium bid. And then as you say, 
And, and by the way, I should say that will be happening while the Fed's printing money, you know, while the Fed's reacting to the bust. But we're not in a vacuum there. We're going to be printing money, but so is everybody else. So they will will just get the relative benefit of being seen as the safest place to go. Um, and then as we go through the balance of the decade, I think the dollar runs into trouble simply because um, that massive money printing and we're going to be the biggest money printer all central banks are going to be doing something similar but we have more more ability to do it we're going to be creating so many dollars and with a lag that's what i think causes the bear market and dollar that i think over the course of the decade could take the dollar from you know 120 140 wherever it goes during the bust down to below 50. i mean that's that's horrendous numbers i mean and and I think it really, you know, speaks to, um, you know, we are at the end game of, of something that's been going on for decades and it's not going to be good for the U.S. for sure. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are predicting this sort of basket of currencies as we start to move into sort of a digital age of money. So, I mean, I'm just going to ask you straight out. Do you believe, do you forecast that the dollar will eventually fail in the next 10 to 20 years? Next 10 to 20, I think that's very likely. The next five, which is where a lot of people are, where they're talking about a reset and, you know, an IMF basket taking its place or, you know, electronic currency taking its place, I'm not there. I mean, I think in the next five years, the dollar will still be the reserve currency, the primary reserve currency. Part of that is because as bad as we are, the euro is going to be worse. We, you know, in 2008, nine, we led the parade down you know, subprime and all of that. This time around, Europe's in much worse shape than we are, as bad as we are, and we're in bad shape. Europe's in worse shape. I think their financial system's really going to be vulnerable. And I'm not sure the euro survives the bust. I mean, uh, you know, it may. It you know, probably is not a high probability call to say it won't. I'm not forecasting, but I, I think the risk is that the euro breaks apart because, you know, the Italy's and Spain's of the world are not going to be able to withstand if, if they try to, you know, say you got to, you know, you've got to take on more discipline. I think the countries are going to all be looking out for themselves. Um, so, so it's not so much that the dollar is great. It's that the alternatives are worse. Um, and so I think the next five years, the dollar's still there. It will lose status gradually. As we get to the end of the decade, though, for sure, I think, you know, the dollar's in much more vulnerable place then. And, and you know, I'm calling for uh, um, industrial recovery around the world, an inflationary recovery like the 1970s to follow the bust. Um, it's going to be, you know, like I said, it's going to be global. Um, but that it's going to probably see a retrace of inflation from negative inflation. I'm calling for a deflationary bust. So negative inflation next year to potentially 20% inflation or higher by the end of the decade. That's beyond anybody's capability of managing that. You know, when you've got multi, multi trillions of dollars in debt, how do you finance it? Because interest rates will also be up in those double digits. So I don't know how that equation works. I can only say that I think that's what the policy is going to lead to. And, and if it does, um, you know, it's, it's not going to speak very well to our economy, the world economy, what comes from that. In other words, I, I think the bust is the precursor of a much bigger collapse in the 2030s. So uh, I wish... I wish I could bring more optimism, but it, it, I, don't, I just don't see how the equation um, settles out in a positive way. Yeah, you don't see us continuing to kick the can down the road. Um, I mean, some of that is so scary, and I know you're focused on the economy and the markets, but how does, what does life look like under that scenario? Because, you know, I'm a millennial. I graduated right into that terrible recession. Um, my family actually lost everything in the financial crash. So it's one of the reasons why I'm very interested in all of this. And, you know, the average person, I think, doesn't have some of the, that inside information to be able to make strategic moves and protect themselves. Um, so, I mean, what does everyday life in America look like under your prediction? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I try to get my kids to listen to this, and they don't either. But um, <laughs> it to me, to me, where we have we have this decade to prepare ourselves for what I think is is not going to be a pleasant experience for most people. I mean, I can get as I say, the difference between me and the true gloom and doomers out there that are talking about a collapse now is that I believe all that money that's going to be, you know, the response to the bust is going to create one more cycle. So we have one more cycle behind the bust and then all bets are off. I, uh, you know, I can talk about a government that's totally bankrupt. There's no social security. There's no welfare system. There's no, you know, and, and unemployment that could be well north of 50%. How, you know, how do people in this country survive that? I don't know. And that's not even looking at the geopolitical stuff. You know, all the, all, you know, our world's not getting easier to deal with. So I, I don't say it to scare people. I just tell people you've got, you've got this decade, the 2020s, to get your houses in order and realize it's not about, you know, yeah, our, our parents did it and their parents did it. We just, you know, and, and frankly, the, my generation and your generation, unfortunately, everybody wants to point the finger at the Fed and I go, we're all to blame. We, we took on a shop till you drop, live for today mentality. And now it's coming back. It's payback time. You know, it's, you can't, you can't borrow from your future and then say, How, well, my future is going to be fine. And so, you know, it, certainly the government made it so much worse, but we're all, you know, we all voted those people in. We all thought you can have your cake and eat it too. So um, what I do really say though, because that is such a gloomy forecast is, you know, I can compartmentalize. You know, I don't stay up at night thinking about the 2030s, <laughs> but I know some people do. Uh, I mean, uh, I try, and you see me on Twitter say this, let things play out in, the, in terms of focus on, you know, we're, we're talking about the biggest parabolic run into a top here that we've seen since 29. We're talking about, you know, the biggest downturn in the post-World War II era following that. So don't jump ahead two cycles and worry about the 2030s. You know, focus on now um, because, uh, number one, I can be dead wrong. You know, I, I put out my forecast. I'm, you know, I try to be as straightforward as I can be, but I don't really like to get too far out because I know how it can scare people and then they, they can dwell on it. And really, it's I only put it out there to say you do have time here. Um, you know, don't speculate. Just get your house in order. Yeah, I know it's interesting to hear you talk about that concept of shopping now, paying for it later, um, that concept of, you know, high time preference versus low time preference. And I've learned a lot in the last year just about the difference between the Austrian school and the Keynesian economics. So do you almost feel like this is an opportunity to get back to more of a free market system and um, maybe even an opportunity to, you know, reset sort of this idea of harder money or sound money that we really haven't seen in so long? I, I would say if, I, if, if as a theoretician, yes, definitely. If, if I had my druthers, that's what my prescription would be. I agree with the Austrian school. I don't agree with the Austrian school at all because I don't think it's realistically where we're going. As I say, I'm not endorsing my forecast by any means. I'm just forecasting. You know, I'm telling you what I think is going to happen, not what I wish would happen. So, but I'm, I'm, I, you know, I hit back at the Austrians all the time because they're so, uh, you know, I don't think reset, the reset in the next few years is, is realistic or likely. Um, what comes after a collapse of the system? It's possible that it's, you know, because this is what basically I think a lot of Austrians like to believe is that, you know, let's bring on that collapse now so we can cleanse the system and start it over. And I'm afraid what's going to come out of a collapse of a totalitarian worldwide system. I mean, we're going to that anyway. New world, new world order, in my opinion, is code for communist takeover of the world. So, you know, China, Russia, and frankly, the, the left in this country is basically pushing for what, what the left understand what they're doing, whether they're part of a strategy or whether they're just naive. All I can say, and, and frankly, a lot of a lot of um, Republicans too that are pushing for new world order, you know, globalism is great, et cetera. 
if they only knew what was driving that boat. It's really pushing towards, you know, a, a very leftist government, whether it be United Nations or wherever, heading it up, running the world, you know, and it'd be, you know, kiss America goodbye, kiss free markets goodbye. It won't be that. And it won't be soft socialism like in Europe. It will be very hard left communism. Um, so that's what I fear out of a collapse is that what replaces that is totalitarianism. Do I know that? No, that's just just a, a fear. Well, I think this is a good place to ask you about Bitcoin, because right now there is this movement. I mean, to be honest with you, a lot of the Bitcoiners that um, I've been studying and interviewing, they're all Austrian economists, and they believe that Bitcoin is that potential for, you know, if the U.S. dollar were to fail, it is scarce sound money. Uh, it could be this reset that we're looking for and that we might potentially need to avoid that doomsday scenario you're talking about. Do you follow Bitcoin? Do you believe in it? And, you know, as a con can you be a true contrarian today and not believe in Bitcoin? Actually, I think a contrarian doesn't believe in Bitcoin. I, you know, it's, it's early in, in its, you know, advent. So in some ways, yes, I get what you're saying, but I, I it's partially for what you just said. I think it falls into that that um, crowd that thinks we're going to have a reset and that this is this is the reset. You know, it's going to be you know the the Austrians. Um, and again, if this were fifty years ago, I'd probably be on their side. But the Austrians believe that the Fed is evil and you know central banking is evil and and that it's made a mess of the world. And like I said, it's it's a great scapegoat. But I think we're all at, at you know, if it hadn't been central banks, it would have been, you know, our governments and et cetera. Um, so I, my, my fear is that Bitcoin, I have no idea about the long term um, nature of, you know, what's going to come out of the collapse or what have you. But I think it's premature to think that Bitcoin or crypto is going to replace um, our government controlled money systems. Um, before 2030. There, it's just not going to happen. Um, and I think, unfortunately, there's an awful lot of speculation in, in those markets. And a lot of it is driven by that belief that it's going to happen much sooner. Um, and, you know, rightly or wrongly, I don't, I don't think our governments are going to go, uh, go away um, quietly. So, <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I kind of beg off by saying I don't follow Bitcoin, but I, I really think, um, for me, my convictions come from things that I've studied for a long time and, and that have long, um, histories and Bitcoin's so new that I couldn't ever be a conviction, um, forecaster of it. So that's part of what keeps me away. Um, and part of it is just really there are, I, I'm not real com comfortable with the company I'd be keeping uh, in terms of there's a lot of people who are failed, failed hedge fund managers who now are Bitcoin fan, you know, the gurus of Bitcoin. I mean, those, those are not people that I would feel real comfortable following along with. So, uh, but it's, it's not that so much, but it does feel like there's speculation. Uh, of course, a lot of the interest in Bitcoin in the last six months has been the great run it had, you know, it's no different than um, why, you know, some of our stocks get, uh, go to the moon, you know, mo momentum begets more momentum. So, uh, you know, I, I were, I, what I'd like to see is, let's see how crypto handles the bust. Coming out the other side, I'll have more history. You know, they really haven't had to endure something like that yet. So, Let's see how it, you know, let's see where it goes during the bust. Um, but as I tell people, I don't follow it. So I'm the last person anybody should listen to on this anyway. Because I, if there's one place I could be really dead wrong, it's there. <laughs> well, yeah, if, if last March is any indicator, I mean, Bitcoin fell down to, you know, 3,000. Obviously, it had this massive parabolic super cycle melt up, it feels like, but it did fall along with stocks. It seems to kind of go hand in hand. So I would imagine, I would predict that it would go, it would fall just as hard, if not maybe harder than the stock market. Um, I know you don't give advice in terms of, you know, investing, but just um, if you could 
sort of offer a bit of guidance for people. Maybe they're on the younger side, professionals still working on the, you know, on their careers, or maybe they're on the other end of that and they're sort of winding down and preparing for retirement. Over the next five years, what, what should they really be doing in terms of just protecting their their wealth and their families? Yeah, like I said before, I think the most important thing is to have a, as, and it's not always possible, but as much as possible, a clean balance sheet. You know, try to try to focus on savings and investment. This country long ago um, got away from savings and investment. It became, you know, what can I buy today? You know, there, there's, if people would spend as much time researching investment and how to save as they do, you know, um, what furniture to buy or what yeah. nice new car to buy, or, you know, those are depreciating assets. Focus on things that can appreciate. And then the other piece of that is from a you know, broad investment standpoint, um, I really tell people look forward, don't look backwards. The, the, and this is true of a lot of professionals. When you, when you see one of the reasons I, I like to forecast or have done so well in forecasting, I recognize early on, the vast majority of forecasters basically are telling you what just happened. They're not telling you what's going to happen. They're extrapolating the past. That's true of the stock market. That's true of the economy. So if you can understand that that's, you know, just because people are so-called qualified experts, most of them are doing that. If you can kind of become a little bit more independent and realize that, you know, um, looking forward is more valuable than, you know, just what happened. And it doesn't always follow a straight line that that will serve you well in the investment circles. How difficult is it for you to forecast timing? Because I know that on Twitter before you were, you felt a little bit more confident about maybe end of second quarter for the melt up and you constantly, it seems like probably have to adjust. And I don't know how that makes you feel. I mean, what's, what, what is it like in terms of just thinking about the timing of all this? Um, yeah, I get myself into trouble because I, I tend to put times in there and I think Twitter followers see a time and they think that's specific. And what I'm really saying, and, I, and it's probably because I don't add the parenthetic, but um, I should be saying the earliest it will happen is, for example, second quarter 2021. They're seeing, I say, well, you know, could, could happen by June of 2021. And they read it as, well, you said it was going to happen by June 2021. No, I said could. What I'm really meaning to say is that's the earliest. And then, you know, markets, markets end when they end or markets will get to where they get to. Because what you can't time is those consolidation periods. Is the consolidation between two legs going to be two months or eight months? Um, you know, are you going to are you going to have it kind of bounce around for a few weeks or a few months? So that's what stretches it out. If it goes, um, you know, and I always account for some consolidation, but if it goes in a much slower um, into a longer consolidation, it just stretches everything out. And and even though I I'm always telling other people that they're, you know, they they think everything happens bing bang boom, and you're because you can talk about it that quickly. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm guilty of it to some extent too. As you you see it playing out, you don't give it enough time to play out. So, for example, the bust, you know. Will the will the bust happen before the end? Will it start before the end of this year? I think so. Is it something I would bet on? No, I'd say let's you know let's see how let's get to the market top first, and then we'll see where we are there. So it may spill over, you know, just like I thought we'd probably see the top by by mid year. It's probably going to be you know now I'll say it's probably going to be you know late summer. Um, so I, I get myself into trouble because I probably should leave the time out of it. <laughs> yeah, those people getting upset about timing, they're trading options and they've got that time decay going. <laughs> See, and you notice that's the other thing I say over and over and it, like it doesn't seem to be heard, but I'm a strategist. I'm not a trader. I'm, um, I'm providing um, forecasts, not trading calls. None of my stuff should be looked upon as short term trading calls because that's not what they are. Um, well, just to wrap up, I know you kind of touched on this already, but I just want to kind of hit on this again. Um, why isn't muddling through the most likely scenario? Because we've done it 
for so long. We keep just going further and further. The secular bull market extends. We do have these dips, but they go right back up. I mean, why why is this time different? Yeah, it's well, keep in mind we've had we've had end of other cycles. I mean, we had 2008-9. So it's it's not so different. It's just that cycles reach a point where excesses build up and you have to deal with those excesses in this case inflation. And when you have a when inflation collides with historic leverage, it just is a recipe for disaster. And no human being can handle when you're between two very opposing extremes, it's very hard to kind of muddle through that. So is it possible that it's a lesser end of a cycle? Sure, you know, bust doesn't have to, as I define a bust, doesn't have to happen. It could get postponed. But in terms of the cycle ending, I think that's pretty inevitable because you've got inflation heating up. Now, if, if, if Paul's right and a lot of those economists that agree with him are right, and that inflation goes back into the bottle and the, you know, the genie can put the top on, um, then maybe you got a couple more years. I think that's highly unlikely. You know, you, you've got a lot of forces out there, including housing, um, putting pressure on commodity prices. And those, they, they can take a rest for a couple months, just like every market. But the demand's going to keep coming until this thing rolls over. And that just means inflation is going to keep going higher. And they're not that far from a pressure point where they have to react. Well, thank you so, so much. I don't know if there's anything else you want to share, but I do want to make sure, um, you know, let people know how they can find you. And I'll, I'll add that to the description of this as well. But thank you so much. Uh, yeah, it was my pleasure. Um, I would say, yeah, they can find me on Twitter. Uh, my handle's at Dave H. Contrarian. Um, and I do have a quarterly letter that if they have interest, it's by subscription, there's, you know, a, a fee to it. So, um, but if somebody is interested, all they have to do is uh, direct message me on Twitter and I will provide details. Awesome. Thank you so much, David. This has been great. I'm going to stop yeah, recording. Yeah, thanks for having me, Natalie. It was fun. It was fun.